So, dear colleagues, today is the day of our Kharkiv Chemical Seminar. We returned from our one-month uh, summer vacation, and today we have special guest from United States, Professor Phil Barron. He was born in uh, 1977 in Danville, New Jersey, and received his Bachelor in Chemistry from New York University in 1997. 1997. His PhD from the Scripps Research Institute in 2001. And from 2001 to 2003, he was in uh, National Institute of Health postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. His independent career began in Scripps in the summer of uh, 2003. Uh, Phil has published over 2,050 scientific articles, several patents, and has been the recipient of several American Chemical Society awards, such as the Cori, Pure Chemistry, Fresenius, and the Nobel Laureate Signature, and several international distinctions, such as the uh, Hirata Gold Medal and Mikayama Prize, the Royal Society of Chemistry Award in Synthesis, the Seckler Prize, and the um, Jensen Prize. In 2013, he was named in the MacArthur Foundation Fellow. In 2015, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2016, he was awarded the Blavantic National Award. In 2017, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. He has delivered hundreds of lectures around the world and uh, cons consult numerous companies. He currently serves as a scientific advisory board member for Edzai, Alkmers, Nutcracker, Quanta, and Asimchem. From 2016 to 2020, he served as the associate editor of uh, the American Journal of the American Chemical Society. He co-founded um, Serena's Marine Discovery, uh, v uh, Vividion uh, Therapeutics, and other companies. The Baron Laboratory uh, is committed to identifying areas of chemical synthesis that can have a dramatic impact on the rate of drug discovery and development. This is achieved both through the development of practical total synthesis of complex natural products such as terpenes, alkaloids, peptides, and oligonucleotides, and by identifying, inventing reactions which can dramatically simplify retrosynthesis. And I think it's time to start uh, the lecture. And dear colleagues, please switch off your microphones during the lecture. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much uh, for the super kind introduction. And thanks everybody for the opportunity to visit you this afternoon. It's a real honor for me. And uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we do in the group by focusing on one particular niche of chemistry that we've been involved in for over a decade now. And it all starts with the lab beginning in 2003, where we thought about how we could do synthesis a little bit differently and essentially cut out the steps that everybody hates to, to do in organic chemistry, namely the functional group into conversions, the protecting group manipulations, the redox fluctuations that are not strategic. And what if you could make a molecule by only making the strategic or skeletal bonds, that is carbon-carbon, carbon-oxygen, carbon-nitrogen bonds. And I'll be focusing a lot on how to make carbon-carbon bonds today. And in particular, the question of how can electrochemistry aid in the practice of achieving as ideal or simple of a synthesis as possible. And where we begin <clears throat> is the oldest CC bond forming reaction in organic chemistry. It's my favorite reaction. It's known as the Kolbe reaction. And uh, it was discovered in 1834 by Faraday when he took acetic acid and he electrolyzed it and made some bubbles. And about 10 years later, Kolbe came around and said, hey, Faraday, those bubbles you made that's ethane, and now we call it the Kolbe reaction. And if you were to imagine you knew nothing about organic chemistry at all, and the first day of class, they showed you this reaction at the top where you could take two different acids and put them together and make a carbon-carbon bond, the question for you is, would you use on the midterm or the final exam of Wittig hydrogenation or Wurtz coupling or anything like that uh, ever again? And probably the answer is no. I mean, if this reaction were to exist, and you were taught it, probably you would use it to make most of your carbon-carbon saturated bonds. And yet, it doesn't exist. And if you fast forward a few hundred years, you see that nobody uses the Kolbe reaction. In fact, most radical reactions are nowhere to be found up until about 10 years ago in modern pharma. And so why is it that the Kolbe is virtually ignored? And the problem is one that comes down to chemoselectivity. It has no chemoselectivity at all. 
The only examples we can find in the literature of the use of Colve are scattered. Um, as you can see here, <clears throat> if you can dimerize an acid that has no functional groups, that works. Um, it's used in a couple of syntheses, as you, as you can see here. But essentially, its use in organic chemistry is, is limited to a couple of theoretical papers, a bunch of reviews, and mostly people yelling about how this reaction has no chemoselectivity. And the reason for that is because it is highly oxidative in nature. You take your compound and you basically electrolyze it with so much electricity that there are no functional groups that can withstand the strongly oxidative nature of this reaction. And so the canonical version is strongly oxidative, uses a very high overpotential platinum electrodes. And we wondered, what if we could, instead of doing this oxidatively, somehow render this reaction reductively activated in a mild way? And so we reasoned that if we were able, instead of using the free acid, using a redox active ester, an uh, N-hydroxythalamide ester, maybe you could inject an electron into these species, liberate CO2 gas, and the radicals that are generated somehow template them with the proper catalyst and ligand and get these two species to come together in a heterocoupling process. Now, this is a reaction that we were dreaming about for a very long time. And every time I would pitch this to an incoming postdoc, they would sort of say, well, do you have any other projects? Until finally I found one very talented postdoc who didn't ask that question and instead said, okay, I'll try. And his name is Ben Chung. And he found that he could get this reaction to work simply by modulating, most importantly, the ligand. The ligand was the key <clears throat> to getting synthetically useful yield of product. So you activate your acid in the same way you activate it for amide bond coupling, except you don't add the amine to form an amide. Instead, you simply add your nickel, ligand, uh, solvent, and electrolyze. Uh, this is done in a one-pot process. Extremely simple. And the control studies show that you can't recapitulate this reactivity with normal chemical conditions. Also, we collaborated with our friend Martins over at Bristol Myers Squibb, and he tried every photochemical condition you could you could imagine, some of which are shown here. And he saw no heterocoupled product, only homocoupling of the primary acid. So the scope of this reaction is really good. A lot of functional groups are tolerated. And because carbon-carbon bonds are found throughout organic chemistry, it's very easy to arbitrarily choose substrates from SciFinder and remake them using this new route. And instead of taking you know, many steps, as you see here, generally these syntheses are, are one-step one um, syntheses from commercially available materials. You can do primary-secondary couplings as well and pretty good yield. You can do secondary-secondary couplings to make some really useful medchem looking like building blocks. And primary tertiary couplings work as well. Although the general generality of this is not very high until I show you what we developed um, just recently later on in the talk. You can also do these tricks where you take a desymmetrized acid and you do sequential cross coupling. Either one cross coupling or the other, just by changing the order, gives you either an antimer of these uh, insect pheromones. Um, so they can be made now instead of in, in a dozen steps and just three by an approach which is very modular. So if you're a medicinal chemist or let's say you were a beetle and you need to make a library of pheromones to attract the female beetles, this would be a good reaction to use instead of biosynthesis, by the way, in case there's any beetles. Anyway, Yang here is the key person who figured this chemistry out. And I wanted to show you the procedure of this reaction because it's so darn simple. I've run this reaction myself. You basically activate your carboxylic acid, just like you do a mide bond formation, except don't add the amine. Instead, add your nickel, press a button on the potentiostat, and after the after an hour and a half of electrolyzing, it's done. It's extremely simple reaction. I, I haven't really, I mean, I, it's hard to imagine a reaction that's easier than this one that I've run over the years. And so I challenged the team and I said, I want you to do this under the worst possible conditions. Use your lowest quality nickel, uh, technical grade of everything. Uh, don't do it in a fume hood. Use wet solvent, the worst conditions you can find. And so they wrapped up their machine in a Ziploc bag, did this reaction in a beaker, open to the air. And as you can see, it worked just fine, even on gram scale. So mechanistically, what's going on, it's a little bit complicated. The radicals are involved, obviously. But what I want to focus on is just remind you that the key way that this reaction works is by picking the right ligand. And the right ligand is what templates that key bond forming step, that 
favors product over all the byproducts that can occur. So broadly speaking, you have a redox active ester, you have your nickel species, those are reduced at the cathode. That cathode surface can reduce the redox active ester, the nickel to the active nickel cycle, generating radicals that are then templated by the nickel two species with the right ligand now, two different radicals come together to give you your heterocoupled process. Um, this reaction works even if you use 1.5 equivalents to one instead of three to one, as long as the one of the acids does not like to dimerize with itself. So a tertiary, secondary, cyclic, or a neopental carboxylic acid, because it doesn't like to couple with itself, you can now get away with near stoichiometric amounts of the two acid ingredients to give the desired product. And you see here again, it tolerates some really interesting functionality, despite being a reductive process, even aldehydes and uh, carbonyl compounds and free NH compounds are tolerated without any issue at all. Um, if you want to lower your nickel loading for process scale, you can do that as well. Instead of 20 mol percent, it can be brought down to only eight just by adding acetic acid as an additive. And we think the acetic acid liberates the nickel from the thalamide after the decarboxylation event. So um, I think it's useful to think for a moment about the way people make carbon-carbon bonds in general. That's what sort of gets us excited from a molecule making standpoint. And what I'm gonna do in the next three slides, maybe there's some students on the line today, hopefully this will be useful to them, is summarize roughly 150,000 publications on making carbon-carbon bonds. Um, here's the first 50,000 papers, and they all make carbon-carbon bonds by basically making unsaturated compounds first and then saturating them. So you do Vitigs or Suzuki's or Hack or Canobinagel or whatever, and then you hydrogenate to make your key CC bond. And here's an example of that. All of these examples are from the MedChem literature. So this steroid homologated was made from the starting material you see above in a seven step process. And out of those seven steps, only one of them actually made a carbon carbon bond. The rest of these steps is completely a waste of time. Like it's good chemistry because you feel really happy when you run these reactions, TBS protections, reduction, oxidation, the TLCs look great and the columns I'm sure are very um, enjoyable to run. But at the end of the day, you're really not accomplishing anything. Alternatively, you can take the same starting material. There's no need to protect the alcohols on that steroid and just couple it directly with the um, acid you see above the arrow. The reason you need a TBS there is just because if you don't have it, it lactonizes when you make the redox active ester. Anyway, one step from commercially available materials, you get the exact same product. And uh, it's 100% ideal because that step is just making a carbon-carbon bond. Here's case study two, where the carbon-carbon bond is made generally by alkylation, Wurtz coupling, frito crafts reaction, or let's say an alkyl Suzuki type reaction. And this compound was made in seven steps, and it's a very simple looking keto containing amino acid. But look at the steps involved. Out of those seven steps, there's only one that makes a carbon-carbon bond. The rest of these steps is a complete waste of your time. I mean, look at these steps. Do, does anybody want to do this stuff? Shalkoff auxiliaries, uh, I mean, um, pyrophoric reagents. Who wants to do this? Alternatively, you just take a, a glutamic acid, the keto acid, you, you go have a cup of coffee, and when you come back, you get the same exact product with 100% EE. These are very mild conditions, so the glutamic acid is not racemized during the reaction. The third 50,000 reaction batch of, of examples is this one. I think this is the funniest one because in this case study, people don't make any carbon-carbon bonds at all. They basically take a pre-existing architecture and they decorate it, like kind of like putting ornaments on a Christmas tree. So here's an example of a MedChem literature compound where a very simple looking amino acid took eight steps to make. No carbon-carbon bonds were made. They did make one carbon nitrogen bond and they used chiral auxiliaries and they looked and they said, oh, the final product looks like a pyridine cinnamate. So we take the pyridine cinnamate and we decorate it and we reduce it and we do all this stuff, tazalazide. Um, you know, look at this chemistry. How many times are using palladium and, you know, uh, alkylation, tazalazide? Who wants to do this stuff? Like nobody wants, to, nobody I know in chemistry wants to do these reactions, but they do it because they need to make the product. 
Alternatively, you just take two commercially available acids, aspartate, couple it together, 100% EE, and you get the exact same product. So the question, I guess, for the students is, why do people keep doing this? And I think the answer comes from the way they were educated as small children. When you were a child, your parents taught you that opposites attract. They taught you about the north and south pole of a magnet and how those like to attract. And then when you got older and they taught you organic chemistry, they taught you polar bond theory. That is doing retrosynthetic analysis by applying partial charge to the functional groups and then looking at the plus and the minus, plus and the minus, and disconnecting between the plus and the minus. It feels good because that's the way you were taught from the time you were a kid. But in actuality, this mode of analysis has led to the protecting group industrial complex, functional group manipulations, and a whole slew of things you need to memorize the rules and regulations for. In fact, this problem manifests itself even in the computer-aided retrosynthesis world. So if you take a look at compound one and two and you plug it into a computer, the same flawed logic is spit back out because that's how the computers were programmed as well. So the routes that are proposed in these software to make compound one and two are really garbage. These are routes that nobody wants to do, but they're what you know we taught the computer to tell us. Alternatively, if one uses radical retrosynthetic logic, you divorce the polar bond theory from the disconnection you need to make. And instead, you make convergent disconnections that are based on simple starting material availability. In fact, if you were to give compound one to a small child as a plastic molecular model and ask them, how would you make this compound? And here's a bucket of building blocks that are all carboxylic acids. They would come back in a few minutes and they would say, hey, I found this square and I found this hexagon. Can I put them together? And they would be correct. So you can now make these compounds in a, a fraction of the amount of time and, and steps that previously required. You can think of decarboxylative cross-coupling akin to cross-metathesis by the late, great uh, Bob Grubbs in his seminal publication on olefin cross-metathesis, where he showed how you could take two different olefins and following exposure to a ruthenium catalyst and loss of ethylene gas, make another olefin. And in the same vein, you can imagine now two carboxylic acids coming together, loss of CO2, and a carbon-carbon sigma bond can be generated. Let's turn now uh, the story over to uh, total synthesis. So this steroid is, of course, a famous compound that many people have made over the years, Stork and um, Eschenmoser, Corey, Woodward, Johnson, Van Tamelen. There's a whole list of people who have worked on compounds like this over the years, and they have shown that nature's way of doing cation pi cyclization is probably the best way of making these compounds. But the problem is when you think about making the polyunsaturated compound as one geometrical isomer, the methods in order to do that fall short of being truly ideal. And so these two talented graduate students, Steve and Max, decided to solve this problem by coming up with a very different way of thinking about the problem. Now, first, let's look at the way you teach this to students. I hated teaching this to students because it made no sense to me. The only way to understand how those five building blocks on the right turn into the compound in the middle is to memorize the answer because the answer makes no sense. In fact, if I were to tell all of you, you can't leave this webinar, webinar until you figure out how those five pieces turn into the compound in the middle, I think many of us would be here for the rest of the day trying to figure it out. Uh, because it doesn't make any sense at all. <clears throat> so meanwhile, uh, people like the late, great Nagishi showed that you could make olefins not by disconnecting the olefin, but by disconnecting the bond adjacent to it. And nature, for the past few billion years, has shown that you can make terpenes through an assembly line approach, where building blocks are stitched together in the same way you put together an automobile. So we thought, well, what if we could put these two together? What if we could do reductive couplings with vinyl halo acids? Activate, couple, activate, couple over and over again to generate the exact same compounds with one geometrical isomer about the olefins. And the way we did this was by using a reductive electrochemical approach wherein 
you just add an equivalent of silver nitrate, it deposits it itself onto the electrode, generating nanoparticles that facilitate this reaction in a dramatic way. We applied it to the synthesis of, I think, 13 or 14 natural products to show the scope and generality. And I'm going to just briefly show some of those natural products to emphasize the functional group compatibility. Things like free alcohols, even a free carboxylic acid <clears throat> is tolerated. Skip dienes, beta ketoesters, secondary acids work fine, aldehydes, <clears throat> furans, epoxides, very electron deficient beta iodoenoates, <clears throat> esters that are hydrolyzable. And you can even take these building blocks, mix and match them to make any of one of these perfume ingredients that you want on demand. You can apply it to the synthesis of vitamin D analogs or vitamin D itself. The blue bonds shown in this slide are both made through the silver nickel nanoparticle chemistry. What does the silver do? Well, briefly, the silver attenuates the reactivity of the cathode such that the redox active ester is not prematurely reduced and the various nickel species that are need to uh, enable this reaction are not destroyed. We verified the presence of silver nanoparticles and did a million control studies and kinetics to figure out what was going on here all during the uh, COVID period. And if you're interested in the mechanism of this reaction and the many reactions and experiments and kinetics that were done to decipher what was going on, you can scan this QR code. It'll take you to a YouTube video that Max did talking all about the mechanism of this reaction. Anyway, <clears throat> terpenes are interesting to people in academia, but not so much to people in pharma. I think what gets them excited are compounds like this. Let's take, for example, this unnatural amino acid, homotyrosine differing from tyrosine only by the addition of a single carbon atom. And if you look at the price of this compound, it's prohibitively expensive at $1,200 a gram. I, I don't know if that's the enamine price, but it's very, very expensive. And so you wonder, well, why is that? And I think the answer is because uh, all the ways of making it are far from ideal. Uh, look at these ways of making them. You might think, oh, well, how can you, can you just do a Suzuki reaction? Well, look at it. The Suzuki reaction is a 10-step synthesis. And only one of those steps actually makes a carbon-carbon bond. Like, these are horrible routes. And if you gave it to a, a small child, the child would tell you, well, can you just take the little chain and couple it to the hexagon? You know, this disconnection is the one that makes the most sense. But the problem is it's impossible to do that at least until now. So we tried to take glutamic acid and couple it directly with iodophenol using all the various decarboxylic cross-coupling techniques that have emerged from our lab and other labs over the past decade or so. And as you can see here, none of them were very successful in delivering the product. We wrote a review on this topic. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the citation in a moment, but for those of you that don't remember, there are several ways of doing decarboxylic cross-coupling using canonical reactions like Nagishi, Kumada, Suzuki, reductively or oxidatively activated. And none of these manifolds work to deliver the product. So we went to all of our collaborators, including Enamine, six different companies, and we said, hey, do you like decarboxylic coupling? And they all said, yeah, we like it. The problem is it doesn't work when we need it to. And we said, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, when we're using heterocyclic systems or compounds that are a little bit more electron rich, none of the methods that are out there work for chemoselectivity problems. And some of the redox active esters that we try to couple also don't work or free acids. They also decompose prematurely or dimerize with themselves. And we wondered if the silver nanoparticle chemistry I showed you for terpene synthesis would somehow help in this process. So we went to those companies and we said, could you give us a list? of all the reactions and coupling partners that do not give you any product. And that will be what we focus on for this paper. And so a team was assembled. Uh, there was about, I don't know, 20 people on this paper from all the six different companies out there. And the team was led by Max and Gabriele, uh, joined up with Jen and Tamara and Simon. And we tried to solve this puzzle. Now, I think one of the most interesting statements that the, one of the med medicinal chemists told us um, was the following. He said, Phil, what academics don't understand 
is that medicinal chemists would rather have a reaction that gives you 10% yield on 90% of the substrates. And what is often published in JAX are reactions that give 90% yield on 10% of the substrates. And, and that's really true. And it's because people don't understand what people in, in companies actually want. So we, we worked with our company collaborators and compared these reactions that don't work in their hands to all the techniques that are out there, including this new reaction. Again, we joined forces with Martin, who was nice enough to compare all the known methods that are out there using their um, redox uh, know-how. And as you see here in the uh, compounds that are floating across the screen, one thing that's really um, dramatic about this is that many cases are binary, where you get product with this chemistry or almost nothing at all with any other method that's out there. So currently, this method is the most broadly applicable and uh, useful way of doing alkyl arylation. So taking an aryl system and coupling it to an alkyl fragment, uh, there's no other method out there that's so broadly useful. And that makes sense given now the wide industry adoption of this method, despite it only being about a year old. Here's one example from a real company where um, this compound in the box was they tried to make it through every known method, including even Suzuki followed by reduction. However, when they tried to reduce, in, instead of reducing the olefin, uh, it aromatized. So even a Suzuki reaction didn't work here. And um, this reaction worked on the first try. It led to a, a compound which is now being pursued in the clinic because they could make dozens of analogs in a week instead of struggling to even make one. The procedure for this reaction is ridiculously simple. Uh, you don't need any special PPE. You don't need to degas anything. You don't need special equipment, just a simple potentiostat. I ran the reaction myself and I was struck by the most difficult part of setting up the reaction was just weighing out the starting material. That was the hardest part for me. After everything was weighed out and I put it in the vial, then all you do is press the button and that's it. You can do this reaction in parallel. So you can do 19 reactions at a time um, or 24 reactions at a time. And out of the 24, 19 of these worked. Um, you can then take those ones that worked and you can scale them up in the carousel. Out of those six that were scaled up, one of them um, is just not a stable compound. So it decomposes upon storage on the bottom right. You can also use this reaction on uh, redox active esters that are not so stable just by making them in situ and using them directly. As you can see here, the functional group tolerance again is quite dramatic to make some compounds that I think would be very difficult to make um, in any other way. And you can scale this reaction up as well. So everything is open to the air. The recirculating flow reactor there, you see the cost of all the equipment in that box is about $200. So very, very inexpensive to make these compounds now on scale. If you need any homotyrosine, you can email me. I can send it to you. Don't pay $1,200 a gram for it, please. Um, we've also extended this now recently to uh, tertiary couplings to make quaternary centers, as you can see here. So no other method is able to make these types of compounds. And now we can make um, quaternary centers using tertiary acids, directly coupling, even heterocyclic systems. And the applications are rather dramatic. As you can see here, all those four examples are found directly out of the patent literature. And you can look at the way people make these compounds. Uh, they're basically hammer and tongs, ring synthesis methods, because there are no direct means to do these couplings. Now, you can just make the exact same compounds in a fraction of the amount of time and in one step instead of all these miserable steps people are using. Um, so I don't know what will happen with this chemistry, but the hope is that maybe in 70 years or so, this will be, you know, as boring of a reaction as a my bond formation. <clears throat> you know, keep in mind 70 years ago, the most exciting reaction of the day was a my bond formation, hard to believe. But now 70 years later, it's the most common and the most boring reaction of all time. So who knows, maybe in, in the year 2090, we'll look back and say, wow, this decarboxylic coupling is really boring. Everybody does it now. Who knows? I also want to call out Pavel. 
um, who's on many of these papers. Um, Pavel, as you know, is a uh, hero for the chemical community and, um, of course, uh, for the Ukrainian chemical community as well. Longtime collaborator, even uh, spent some time in the lab a few years ago. So we're very grateful to him for his great advice and great collaboration over the years. Let's move on to a different type of functional group array. The 1, 2, and 1, 3 functionalized motifs that are found here, <clears throat> which historically have been made through classic two-electron chemistry, such as monic type reactions, aldol reactions, dihydroxylation, amino hydroxylation chemistry, and all those two electron disconnections require with them a bunch of protecting group and functional group manipulations. Alternatively, you can imagine if you could make these motifs by simply taking simple building blocks of carboxylic acid building blocks and throwing them together, you could access these in a fraction of the amount of time. It's a far more intuitive approach. And uh, so we tried this reaction with the proline derivative you see here on the bottom, and unfortunately it didn't work at all under the first generation conditions that I started off this talk with. However, when we added silver to this reaction, now the reaction started to work pre pretty well. So the scope of this reaction is really good. I'll show you some examples in a moment, but here's some very basic, simple examples to just provide some thought provoking question for you, which is if you were to put these compounds on a exam for a graduate student and ask them what bond is strategic to break, the blue bond would be the wrong answer until now. So nobody would break the blue bond, but now you can. <clears throat> this can be used in a way to simplify synthesis in a dramatic fashion. For example, the compound shown here through a two electron approach was made in seven steps. And now you can just take glycine, a glutamate derivative, and throw them together to make the exact same compound. This compound here was made, this homologated sugar was made in six steps, but now you can just couple directly two readily available carboxylic acids and make the exact same compound as one diastereomer. You can also do something really cool, which is to repurpose uh, the Lipitor building block. So Lipitor is made from this building block, which is very cheap, commercially available, and it represents a really unique cassette for making polypropanates as an alternative to aldol chemistry. So if you do this cross-coupling with a ligand, you get exclusively the cis-diol. If you have no ligand, you get only the trans. Mechanistically, we think it's due to the anomeric effect, that if there is no ligand, the anomeric effect is what dictates the stereochemistry leading to the trans-diol. However, when you have a big ligand, now the anomeric effect is overridden by steric hindrance of that bulky ligand, giving you now the cis-diol product. This phenomenon can be used to make a countless number of natural products. I'll show you a few of them here. So using this cis-diol chemistry, you can make all of these natural products shown here that were previously made in many, many steps. And in making those using two electron chemistry, you need to memorize Falcon on transition states and steric chemistry and protecting groups. And there's a lot of memorization involved, a lot of things you need to know. Now, um, a child could make these natural products just by knowing about this simple Lego chemistry. You do cross couplings and deprotect, and you get your exact same product, as you can see, in a fraction of the number of steps. You can use the trans diol chemistry to now fashion these natural products. Um, in many cases, we're doing more than one decarboxylative coupling to forge all these key CC bonds with great stereochemical fidelity. And as you can see, they compare quite favorably to these other approaches. If you dig into the supporting information of this paper, you'll find the comparison to the other routes. And uh, those other routes are rather miserable. A lot of pyrophoric reagents, a lot of tin chemistry, um, and in this case, you don't have any of that. All of these natural products can be made sort of even without a fume hood if you don't have one. And here's another example, um, one of my favorite ones to show how, how this chemistry can be deployed. Uh, this natural product was made in 12 steps using um, tin chemistry, oxymichael chemistry, um, you know, a lot of memorization required to get the stereochemistry right. Alternatively, you start off with the Lipitor fragment you do a decarboxylative coupling with octanoic acid. 
you do another decarboxyl coupling with the same compound we started with. Now you have a tetraol. You do a decarboxyl of alkenylation to give you the precise Z geometry of the olefin. And then you treat with acetic acid and you get the same compound in half the number of steps. Uh, not to mention, <clears throat> you don't have any pyrophoric reagents. There's no Dibol, Swern, Vitig, none of that. Um, you can make alkaloids using this chemistry. So this compound previously was made in a two electron approach, eight steps to make this key intermediate. Now it can be made in one, just by starting off with the lay auxiliary, coupling it to a fatty acid and deprotect. And that, that's it, you're done. You can also do doubly decarboxylative coupling to make in an interselective fashion, the formal equivalent of alpha alkylation. When this chemistry was developed, the key part of this development was the finding that you, you add both magnesium bromide and iron bromide for reasons that are not 100% clear at the moment. And the key ligand shown here, L15, could now render the synthesis of compounds like three uh, fairly trivial as one enantiomeric form. And the scope of this reaction is really good. Even free phenols are tolerated. I mean, you can tolerate things that wouldn't be tolerated with um, Evans kind of alkylation chemistry. And you can simplify the practice of synthesis. So here's an example. Um, this compound took 15, 15 steps to make as an inseparable mixture of diastereomers. Look at the steps there, folks. Does anybody want to do that stuff? We've got chromium, Grignards multiple times. We've got platinum. I mean, lithium aluminum hydride. Who wants to do this? Nobody wants to do this stuff. Instead, now you can just make the same compound in, in a couple of steps. So you make your redox active ester, you do decoboxyl coupling, and then deprotect, and you're done. <clears throat> Here's an example of a compound that was made in 10 steps. Again, look at the chemistry and think about actually having to do it in the lab. <clears throat> Nobody wants to do it. Now you can just take a commercially available indol, make the redox active ester, cross couple, deprotect, and you're done. Here's an example that was made in 12 steps. Very simple compound. Like, why does that take 12 steps to make? It doesn't make any, any sense to me. Now it can just be made in a fraction of the number of steps, um, starting from a very simple carboxylic acid. So um, in the final, I think I have about 15 minutes. In the final 15 minutes or so, let me talk about uh, a type of chemistry, which is really only available to the world of electrochemistry. And that has to do with waveform. So normally, for the past 150 years that people have been doing electrochemistry, uh, you use direct current. And alternating current, which is a type that you get when you plug something into a wall, has been completely underexplored and ignored by the synthetic community. And um, <clears throat> we, we decided to explore this um, with, with my collaborator, Yu Kawamata, an amazing scientist here in my lab. And, you know, many years ago when we started electrochemistry, it's been, I don't know, about a dozen years ago now. Um, I, I talked to people and I said, there were mainly people that focused on electrochemistry. I said, why, why don't people do alternating current? And they laughed and they said, well, people have tried. It's it's a, a waste of your time. It's just going to generate a lot of heat and bubbles and it doesn't do anything and blah, blah, blah. So um, happily, we were um, able to ignore that advice and we decided to explore it ourselves. Now, meanwhile, over the past couple of years, there has been some reports of using alternating polarity, alternating current in order to improve the yields of known reactions. In these first two reactions, these are ones that we reported that people then improved the yield of by changing the type of waveform. And the bottom one from the Hill group is another example of showing how you can get unique product distributions by using electrochemistry that controls the waveform. However, what these reactions didn't do was what we wanted to do, which is, can you use the waveform to completely alter the course of a reaction? That is, under one waveform, and get one type of product, and in another waveform, get a completely different product. We weren't interested in, in improving yield. We were interested in getting reactions to work that either didn't work before or would give a completely different product. <clears throat> and so we worked on a type of polar uh, waveform called rapid alternating polarity, which basically takes the cathode and the anode 
and switches it up faster than you can blink an eye. And the idea was that if you alternate the polarity really, really, really quickly, maybe you could encourage fast reactions to take place and that would maybe inhibit the slow reactions. Now, the problem with all of this we realized very early was that nobody would want to do this chemistry if they needed to buy a signal transducer, um, a potentiostat, and an oscilloscope, right? You know, organic chemists are not engineers. So we went to our friends at ICA and um, we said, hey, it'd be really nice if you could update the software to install this new type of functionality. And they did that. And uh, now all we had to do was invent some, some something you could actually use this type of uh, waveform on. So back in 2019, everybody's electrosyn was updated with this new functionality. Um, and I think most people paid no attention because they didn't know what to do with it. And, and neither did we. So we thought, okay, what if we could encourage fast reactions to take place and inhibit slow reactions? So we took this model compound shown here that has a number of things that can happen to it. You can imagine reduction takes place, oxidation takes place. And we just asked the question, well, if we change the waveform, is there any difference? That's it. So here's this compound and we treat it with direct current and there's the NMR on the right. And you can see the NMR is a, a real mess of diastereomers, of regiochemical isomers. It, it's um, kind of useless reaction for making anything preparative. Now, we take the exact same conditions. We don't change anything except we press the button that says rapid alternating polarity. And now look what happens. Only compound B. You can't get compound B by using sinusoidal alternating current. You don't get very much of compound B by using things like a divided cell, a sacrificial anode, a sacrificial oxidant. Only by alternating the polarity in this way do you get such a clean reactivity. And so we were kind of shocked by this. Um, the scope of this is really broad. Functional group tolerance is very high. It can be used to reduce other things as well. But I think what will get you sort of most um, interested by this is the reaction I show here, which I couldn't believe it when um, Kawa showed me the result. So he took this aldehyde 17, exposed it to rapid alternating polarity, and only got compound 18A. No alcohol, just compound 18A and recovered starting material. Now, this is crazy because as all of you know, you're all taught, as I was, that aldehydes are the easiest functional group to reduce. And here we have a compound where the imid is reduced faster than an aldehyde, which is insane. Um, you know, I couldn't believe the result. We reproduced it many times and uh, really, really bizarre. And it can be used to simplify the practice of organic chemistry. So here's an example where our friends at Bristol Myers Squibb, you know, needed to make compound 37. And normally that takes nine steps to make because you need to use an allyl group as a protecting group for an eventual ester because you can't get chemoselective reduction of a compound like 36. But now you can simply do an Evans-Michael reaction that gives compound 36. And then you can reduce using rapid alternating polarity to give compound 37 very cleanly. You cannot do this with any other chemical reducing agent that we or B BMS had tried. So from nine steps now to two steps uh, using very simple chemistry. Note that these rapid alternating polarity conditions, the reducing agent um, is just electrons. There's no metal here at all, just carbon electrodes. Um, you can use this in a very chemoselective way, even to make these protact derivatives for protein degradation, tolerates things like a free glutaramide, tolerates an azide. You can then take these analogs and test them on a cerebron binding assay. Very fast reaction, 30 minutes done, no protecting groups anywhere. And now you can see by deleting one carbonyl group, you get, um, in many cases, far improved uh, protein degradation in the cerebron binding assay. It's a very chemoselective reaction as exemplified with this really bizarre example, where you can take this completely unprotected peptide having tons of oxidizable and reducible groups. And the only thing that happens in the crude NMR is the reduction of the imid to, to the amide. 
Um, and, you know, the NMR yield is very high, but it's very hard for us to isolate this compound, hence the lower isolated yield. And you don't see any product with um, things like direct current. Obviously, chemical reagents won't work here. So why is this happening? Um, there's a picture of the textbook, uh, the Clayton book that most people use for undergraduate. And um, everybody learns that aldehydes are the easiest thing to reduce. So is a thalamide more reactive than an aldehyde? Um, no, that's not what's happening. Rather, it's a different reaction mechanism that is easy to understand if you understand what the graphs on the right, those cyclic voltammetry graphs, are teaching you. They're teaching you about the ground state reactivity of electron transfer. And so mechanistically, the fast reactions that are taking place are single electron transfer to the thalamide nucleus and then subsequent full reduction to the lactam. The slow reaction is the Shono oxidation. And that reaction, which beleaguers the direct current, does not occur with rapid alternating polarity simply because it has no time to happen. And so the way to understand the chemoselectivity is just by looking at the CV or by looking at the LUMO coefficients. And you find that, in fact, a thalamide is more reactive than an aldehyde. However, chemical reagents are always chelating like Dibol or samarium. And so when you have a chelating group, that changes everything. But here, it's only outer sphere electron transfer from the aromatic, from the electrons to the aromatic group directly. And that can't happen with an aldehyde or a ketone. And that's why we get this exquisite chemoselectivity. So here are some of the key people behind this work, uh, Kawa and his team here. And then at ICA, we've got these amazing software engineers who installed the code onto the device. And then our friends at Bristol Myers Squibb who did all the ProTac work. Now, many years ago, Pfizer approached us and said, Phil, uh, if you could invent a birch reduction that we could do in a kindergarten classroom full of kids, that would be great. And I was confused. I was like, what do you, what do you mean? What is Pfizer planning? And they're like, well, we want to do a birch reduction in a pilot plant, but we don't want to use cryogenic conditions. We don't want to use any lithium metal. We don't want to use ammonia. We don't want to use any toxic uh, reagents. Um, so something safe enough that you could do it around children um, because our process team doesn't want to scale up a birch reduction. So we were inspired by the lithium ion battery literature and developed lithium ion electro reduction that now lets you do birch reduction in a very safe way. In fact, like four years ago, when I was giving a lecture at, at Scripps, um, I did this reaction in the auditorium uh, at the podium while, while I was talking. So it's a very easy way of doing a birch reduction. However, the scope of this reaction <clears throat> is not as broad as you would want. Certain types of compounds like heterocycles don't work because those strongly reducing conditions will open up the heterocycle. So take, for example, the case of thiophene ester. The thiophene ester, there's no precedent for its direct reduction. And so we tried many things. As you can see here, the chemical conditions, the best thing we could find was the lithium DVB conditions, entry three. However, the problem with lithium DVB is the DVB. It's super expensive. And so the cost of the DVB is uh, roughly four times higher than the, the starting material, thiophene, that we're using. So Although the yield is okay, 39%, the problem is it's way too expensive to ever do this on scale. We tried our electrochemical conditions and they didn't work at all. And then we tried these regular direct current conditions, just uh, reductive with uh, two carbon electrodes and nothing, that's entry five. And then all we did was we took the exact same conditions from entry five and we simply switched it from DC to RAP. And it became quantitative yield just by changing the waveform. We didn't change anything else. That's the NMR. The top NMR is DC. The bottom NMR is just changing the setting on the device. We didn't change anything else. And you can see here near quantitative amounts of product when you use rapid alternating polarity. The scope of this reaction is extremely broad, tolerates thiophenes, pyrroles, furans, um, indoles, benzothiophenes, benzofurans, electron-deficient aromatics, even some electron-neutral um, 
aromatics are, are tolerated. Um, and there's some unsuccessful examples at the bottom um, just for completion's sake. Even, you know, boronic acids can be tolerated on your arine, which is rather remarkable, I would think. Um, you can simplify the practice of synthesis. So you take these readily available compounds and now instead of making them in four to six steps, they can be made in one. And uh, we have observed during this reaction something rather remarkable. That is under the <clears throat> rapid alternating polarity conditions, you see no gas observed. And under direct current, you see a lot of bubbles happening. And we think that's due to, well, we know now it's due to proton reduction. Proton reduction is generally really fast. And that explains why direct current Birch reductions don't work. So we thought, well, if protons don't get reduced, what if we added a proton? So imagine now we're going to try to do a Birch reduction in the presence of acetic acid. Like if I were to tell you to do a Birch reduction with acetic acid, that would be a good way to blow up your lab and turn it on fire. <clears throat> but here it works. So you can take this bromopyrrole and under standard conditions, the bromine is gone. If you add acetic acid, the bromine is preserved. So now you can make these vinyl bromides directly using a quasi birch reduction and note that these conditions, the there's nothing really expensive here. In fact, it's so cheap that it can be done on kilogram scale in a few standard fume hood. So this was done by Abvi um, under these modified conditions where the most expensive component is your time, the labor. So the person running this reaction is the most expensive part. It's just electrons, some methanol, uh, triethyl ammonium salt. I mean, look at it. Carbon, carbon's pretty cheap. Last time I checked, electrons are pretty cheap. So um, ridiculously simple reaction. Uh, here, here's the mechanism. Um, again, it's facilitated by the rapid alternating polarity where the arine reduction happens faster than anything else. And so this kind of chemistry re is reminiscent of another natural phenomenon. Um, this, this lizard here uh, has the name uh, Jesus lizard. They call it a Jesus lizard. And, and the reason is because before people understood physics, they thought that the only way this lizard could walk on water is an act of divine intervention, that God was literally helping the lizard go across the water. But what they didn't understand is the reason that lizard can do this is not because it is um, uh, uh, given a gift from God, but rather because it moves its legs very quickly for the same reason that an airplane can fly and a honeybee can fly. It's all about the speed. And so if you exchange your cathode and anode fast enough, you can get reactivity that almost looks magical. Now, in the final few minutes, let me return to Kolbe. I told you before that Kolbe has no chemoselectivity, and you thought maybe I was exaggerating. But here is the data from 1998, from 2022. Look at these reactions. You try to do the Kolbe reaction, and it's 0% yield. If the olefin is not there, the yield is 80%. If the aromatic ring is not there in the bottom, the yield is 80%. You put one functional group in there, which you would, I think most people consider an olefin and a benzene ring not to really be a functional group, but the Kolbe reaction has no chemoselectivity at all. That's the problem with it. So we thought, what if we could take rapid alternating polarity and get rid of the platinum and solve the chemoselectivity problem? And so this actually works now. So carbon electrodes, just do an acetone solvent, you can use tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide or even safer alternative to that is just KOH works fine. Uh, and now you can take compounds that are previously impossible to make using Kolbe reaction and now make them very simply. And happily you can take acids that are derived from people's trash. So waste products can now be converted into things that are actually quite expensive. You can see here the prices um, some of these are extremely expensive, um, $10,000 a gram, $500 a gram, $3,000 a gram, $5,000 a gram, and you can make them for free, basically for free. Um, you can also do heterocoupling. Look at the prices of some of these react, uh, reagents, super expensive compounds, $5,000 a gram for some of these compounds. But now 
you know, you can make these in, in your garage for, I don't know, a dollar a gram. I mean, the, the cost is very, very, very low. You're just buying glutamic acid and a simple carboxylic acid. So really, really cheap. Now, I, I like alchemy. I like alchemists. I mean, I think people make fun of alchemists. They say, oh, those folks were really, they were so stupid. They were trying to take lead and convert it into gold. But actually, they were really smart. Isn't that what we're trying to do today? Everybody's trying to do this. Not literally, but they're trying to take things which are really, really cheap and turn them into things that are really expensive with a minimal amount of labor. I think the only problem with alchemists was that they were not thinking big enough. Lead to gold is only a 20-fold uh, up conversion. This reaction gets you to a half a million-fold increase in value. So castor oil can be converted into polymer precursors that are valued at insane cost and now can be made um, pretty much for free. Um, this has been scaled up by AbbVie to make this high-value amino acid that uh, used to be $5,000 a gram, but you know, hopefully now will be um, much more reasonably priced. Why does this reaction work? Well, let's go to Kolbe. The Kolbe reaction, if you actually look at a pH indicator of the reaction, you find that the anode where the oxidation takes place is actually acidic. Now think about this for a minute. In order for the Kolbe to work, you need it to be a carboxylate. And if it's acidic, you're only going to have a carboxylic acid. And that's why you need such a high overpotential, such a strong oxidizing condition, because it simply can't decarboxylate because it's not a carboxylate. In the case of rapid alternating polarity, it's actually basic or neutral. And so now you can have an actual carboxylate, which is far more easy to oxidize and give you a radical. So rapid alternating polarity takes advantage of a pH effect that allows you to have a reactive intermediate that you need to get the reaction to work. Um, so we wrote a review uh, with Kawa that's, uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, it came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, you can check that out. So uh, I'm reached the end of the talk and let me just sort of reflect for a moment. We started working in, in synthetic organic electrochemistry more than a decade ago. And when we started, people thought this is a waste of time. And, and maybe it still is, I don't know. But it has now gone to the point where people in pharma use it quite a bit. And I think it comes down to three main ingredients to make people want to use this stuff. One is education, letting them know that it's not alien reactivity. It's just ET. It's not this ET, it's just electron transfer. So if you understand how electrons are transferred, there's nothing strange about the reactivity. Um, you need equipment. When we started this chemistry, um, people and companies just rolled their eyes and said, okay, we're never gonna do this because they don't wanna get a PhD in arts and crafts building their own potential stat. So we introduced the electrocin and I think it led to a sort of explosion of effort. There's now thousands of these devices in every company you can imagine. And um, it's the only patent I have that's not chemistry, it's engineering. That was a fun two years developing that device. Uh, and then finally, the enablement. You know, um, If you go to a medicinal chemist and you say, hey, I can oxidize your alcohol without chromium and do it instead with electrons, they're just going to laugh at you and say, I, I, I don't care. It's not that medicinal chemists don't like trees or the environment. It's just that they like their job more. So they don't care about sustainability. They care about how do they make a compound they made before in 10 steps? How do they make it in one step? If you can come up with reactions that are enabling, people will want to use this stuff. If you don't know anything about electrochemistry and you want to learn more, we wrote this review a few years ago, you can check out, uh, that has everything you need to know. If you know nothing, you'll know enough to do all the reactions you need to do in just about 10 minutes of looking at the figures and schemes. Uh, and then finally, a question I get often is, how do you compare and contrast this to photochemistry? And I think they're complementary fields. Um, this review that was written by Max and deposited in the archive a few weeks ago, uh, please check it out. But it has the answer to that question. Um, when do you use photocatalysis? When do you use electrocatalysis? It's there. So you don't need to ask me. Just look up that review on the archive. Uh, most important slide is to thank all the folks who made this work possible. I've mentioned them with their picture throughout the talk and to these agencies for their financial support. 
and to the many companies that we collaborate with for their incredible ideas um, and opportunity to collaborate. We're certainly very honored. And to the organizers of this event, it's uh, certainly a great honor that um, you folks would want me to uh, give a talk today and um, certainly, um, you know, stand in awe of of all of you going through this very hard period. We, we are super supportive of, um, you know, the sort of amazing events that are going on over there and uh, really honored that um, uh, you, you wanted me to come talk this morning. So thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much for your very interesting and exciting lecture, uh, especially the last part about uh, alternating polarity, something like miracle. Okay, dear colleagues, what about questions to our speaker? Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi there. Uh, can, I, can I ask some questions? Thank you very much for very impressive results and uh, impressive lecture. I have a couple of questions. One is uh, scalability of this reaction. Is it possible to make flow reaction with two cathodes, uh, with two um, uh, anode and cathode and uh, do it like in flow format? Yeah. In fact, all the chemistry I've shown today is um, uh, quite scalable. Uh, let's see if I still have this slide. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Yeah, when I used to give this talk on um, frequently asked questions, people would ask this a lot. When we first started, we did it in a, in a bucket um, to scale up on mole. We did mole scale in a bucket, and then we did it in a chamber, a TLC chamber, um, and then we moved on to flow. Um, so that's the way people in industry do it now. Merck, uh, BMS, Pfizer, all the people who do electrochemistry on scale, they do it on inflow. Um, as you see here, we publish every paper we publish, we have a scale up example. It's very easy to scale up electrochemistry, uh, far easier than a lot of other ways out there. And, and so uh, many people don't realize the largest chemical processes on the planet are actually scaled up with electrochemistry. So scaling up electrochemistry is actually quite straightforward and practical. Uh, thank you very much. And to relate to uh, question about uh, sensitivity, um uh, you told about uh, nano crystals of silver that are formed on cathode and is it possible to reuse this uh, oh, yeah. cathode mm -hmm. as uh, mm -hmm. reusable catalyst yeah great question so as part of the mechanism of this we study that deeply and um you can use, reuse electrode a dozen times um mm -hmm. So in, you can take a, a pre-plated electrode, use it in another reaction, and you don't add any more silver. So you keep using the same electrode. You can certainly do that. We did that. It's in the paper. Great. <laughs> and next question. I'm sure you have the same answer already published in the papers. But uh, you told that uh, this cold reaction in your form electro format uh, needs just asymmetrical acids because they are tend to dimerize if they are not very much asymmetrical. Uh, but also you mentioned that uh, medicinal chemists are happy to have 10% yield because they don't want to optimize reaction. They just want to isolate the products. And uh, these two ideas can be coupled. For instance, you take any of acids and make uh, at the one time um, at once just three products that can be analyzed for the biological activity, for instance, and isolated by chromatography. And uh, you will have instead of one interesting product uh, in small yield, you will have three interesting products also in small yields, but who cares? Uh, it's a good question. We haven't done that. We always use, for cases where you can get um, statistical distribution, we use three equivalents of the less expensive acid to one equivalent of the more expensive. And the rules for coupling are very similar to the rules for cross metathesis. So if you remember this paper, 
grub refers to grubs refers to type one, type two, and type three olefins. And basically, if you're going to use two type one olefins, that is two sterically unencumbered olefins, you need to use three equivalents or more to one equivalent to the other. But to your point, if you don't care about which one you make, you can certainly do that. Use a one-to-one -one and get a distribution, separate them all, and then explore them for bioactivity. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know, we didn't want to do that just because that um that paper would not have been accepted. <laughs> People... I'm sure you can sell it somehow with your experience, but I know what you mean that selectivity yeah. is something very, very much desirable, but in fact, they don't care about selectivity. They want just products. And if it goes good, if there is more like analogs of these products, yeah. this is and I think if different. People that, if people want to do that, they, they can do it. Okay, thank you very much. And if you don't mind, I will connect you by email. Of course. At, with Valentin Chibanov helps. Thank you okay. very much again. Sure. It was a pleasure to listen to your Thanks. lecture. Today. Thanks so much. Yeah, okay. Alexander Zbruyev, who also works in the field of uh, electrochemistry in our department. Please. Welcome. Alexander. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for a um, very interesting and inspiring lecture. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the uh, difference between slow and fast reactions? Uh, uh, I mean, on the time scale, what uh, pulse durations or frequencies do you use to separate them? In general, we when we invent a rapid alternating polarity reaction, we will explore 10, 50, and 100 millisecond pulse, um, and then optimize after that. So you don't need to screen that many. Usually, you know, 50 milliseconds is, tends to be uh, the right pulse sequence for a lot of these, but you just screen three and then look, and then, then you can choose something in between. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. What about other questions? No. Uh, Phil, do, do you have any examples of uh, real commercial application of your alternating polarity methods or not at the oh. moment? Uh, well, actually, we 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 have patented the um, the last method I showed, and we're in discussions with companies right now uh, on the commercialization of of this method. Because as you can imagine, um, you know there there are a lot of applications for a variety of industries, from alternative fuel, perfumery, um, and specialty chemical companies that would want to you know access these compounds in a in a very inexpensive fashion. So. Yeah, I mean the alternating polarity stuff just came out a couple of years ago is when it started. So, um, but we think that this Kolbe chemistry is going to be uh, very useful on commercial scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about, um, uh, uh, your first uh, part of your lecture, Kolbe chemistry, electro Kolbe chemistry? What about the limitation of of this method? Do you have some limitation of uh, structure? Uh, almost everything works. The only thing that what are the limitations? I mean, we mentioned some of the limitations in the in the supporting information. I, I think uh, if certain nitro groups might be a problem, um, I think if you have a free thiol, that's a problem. But I mean, in general, the chemoselectivity is pretty high. Almost all functional groups you can imagine are, are tolerated. Okay. There's very, very few limitations. I mean, you know, we they're, they're in the SI. We don't hide anything. It's all there, but it's just not very much not 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 a lot of limitations okay thank most you right. carbon carbon bonds most carbon carbon bonds that you want to disconnect you will be able to disconnect Vladislav, please hello thank you for your inspiration speech uh, i have a uh, some question about um, some specific substrates uh, all these uh, um, 
all the topic which uh, you are speaking about is um, was investigated uh, on the simple organic compounds. Well, not so simple, in fact. <laughs> Uh, but what about uh, metal metal organics or um, just uh, complexes with different metals? I know that these uh, substrates are very sensitive for uh, electrochemistry. So did you investigate any reaction of uh, modifying um, organic ligands directly on complex? I mean, or these ligands um, or these complexes are unstable? Well, we have only looked at uh, organ. We have a lot of we've done a lot of organometallic chemistry with electrochemistry. So, um, but we have not taken like you, you mean, for example, a ruthenium or a, a chromium arene complex, and then modify that. Is that what you mean? Yes, you have, for example, some ruthenium uh, polypyridine complex, which are very known and whatever, and you wish to change something on uh, terpyridine, for example. And is it possible to change it? Don't touch an uh, oxidative state of ruthenium, for example. Well, we haven't done that. But if you wanted me to do it, what I would say, the first step for a student who had that idea for a project, I would say the first thing we're going to do, make the complex and then check the CV. That's it. So you look at the, C the cyclic voltammetry of the, of the um, species, and then you look at the reduction in oxidation waves and see if it will be possible to get selectivity on the ligand side without touching the metal. And by looking at the CV, you'll get the answer to the question, whether it's conceivably possible or not. Okay, I got it. I got it. Thank you. You yep. you, you compare you you compare basically CV with uh, um, uh, with the conditions of the reaction on organic part, right? Yeah. No, you, you you not even not even that. You just take a CV. Okay. You just take a CV of the complex, and that'll tell you when, at what electron volt potential things get oxidized and when they get reduced. And in a, in a complex of the type you mentioned, you're going to have a few waves. You're going to have metal oxidize and reduce, and you're going to have ligand to oxidize and reduce, and you'll be able to tell which is which on the CV. And then you'll know, okay, here's a good spot to try. You do constant potential at, say, 1.3 electron volts, and because you think, okay, that wave corresponds to the ligand, maybe I have a chance if I go right there. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yep. I may have also another question, please. Of course. Uh, yeah, okay. Can you tell me, please, uh, you told about this reaction and never mentioned temperature, maybe I didn't notice. Do you have yeah. any influence of temperature or all this reaction are room temperature or maybe it is possible to rule the reaction outcome using temperature as a well? So far we have, uh, so the, the mission of a lab is to make chemistry as simple as possible. And every time you have the practitioner do something, I view it as a deficiency of the reaction. So. Um, if I could just do reactions without stirring even and, and almost nothing, that would be the ideal. So we we don't change temperature in almost any of these reactions. I think there may be one when you scale it up, you just use a zero degree bath because it is a little tiny bit exothermic. Um, and in the case of the birch reduction, uh, the, the original lithium ion birch reduction that we published with Pfizer, this one, um, some of the re some of the substrates require uh, cryogenic temperature, although most of them are room temperature. Other than that exception, everything I've shown today is just room temperature. But generally, the rules are, are the same, lower temperature, but the selectivity lowers rates. Well, oh. um, that's, pr that's probably true. Well, we haven't screened it. Um, so in the case of like the, you know, I think where that manifests itself most dramatically is in uh, an anti-selective chemistry, right? You always see people, mm -hmm. you know, and so in the in anti-selective chemistry to get the EE a little bit higher, we do this one at zero degrees. Okay, thank you very much. Also but we never really, you know, almost always it is room temperature. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maria, do you want to, to ask something? Yeah, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Hello, and thank you so much for uh, such great lecture. Um, and I have a little bit funny question. Sure. Uh, how do you bypass the conflict of interests 
with companies uh, who sell for such big money these companies don't they want to kill you <laughs> no what oh that's uh, no i i mean i think um uh in general the, the conflict of in interest question with companies is a good one um when we deal with large pharma um and we we publish with them we always make sure that the um, uh, the compounds in the paper are not compounds that are uh, a, a causing any IP problem with their current programs. So they obviously won't let us publish substrates that are directly something that they're going to be patenting for a, a drug. <clears throat> and then for the, you know, for the methods that let's say give access to building blocks um, in a much cheaper fashion, uh, I think everybody wins. So, you know, um, mm -hmm. I don't, you can talk to Pavel. We work with him a lot at Enamine. Um, they, I think they, they their advantage for a place like Enamine is that they get to use the methods before anyone else and um, access compounds that uh, other um, companies probably won't do. You know, like Aldrich is a very slow company. TCI, they're very slow. So faster moving companies like Enamine, who are really smart and move quickly, can take advantage of that by delivering to the customers compounds that the other companies are still selling for a thousand dollars a gram and they can beat the price mm -hmm. by tenfold and still make a high profit. So it, it seems like it's a conflict, but actually um, all the companies have been very happy to work with us just because they get first eyes on the reaction sometimes a year before anyone else. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you heard it, Ruk. Do you want to? Hello. Uh, thank you for uh, lecture. And I want to ask about uh, cyclic voltammetry. And uh, is it enough uh, uh, cyclic voltammetry from ECA uh, electrocin uh, to understand the reaction uh, uh, mechanism, or we need to use some uh, potential stats or some uh, other equipment? We, we always use the ICA electrocin for initial analysis of the, um, five more minutes. We, we need, we, we always use the electrocin just for an initial analysis of, of the reaction. Uh, but then when we do deep, deep mechanistic studies where you need more significant figures in your CV, then we shift to a more expensive, fancy potentiostat that is used for analytical purposes, but not for synthetic. But for the initial, um question of like when does something get oxidized when does it get reduced and get a general idea to two significant figures we use the electrocin thank you no hello phil hi uh can you hear me uh yeah i have uh two questions have uh you ever tried using uh electron shuttle instead of the uh, silver nanoparticles oh yeah we tried many things um Unfortunately, we um, have not been able to recapitulate the reactivity of the silver nanoparticles with any kind of mediator of any type at all. Um, so we're still looking, but the silver nitrate is so cheap. And as the other person asked, you can reuse it over and over, uh, but we haven't found any mediator that can do what the silver does. Okay, and uh, here's another question. Uh, we noted that uh, on uh, smaller scales, you used to um, use the RVC uh, electrode. And uh, uh, when you do scale up, then you used to use uh, the graphite or something like that. Yeah. What, what's the reason for that? Is um, that because of their price or something? No, RVC is very, very cheap. You can buy a big brick of it for a few dollars. It's very cheap. And, and graphite is very cheap, but RVC is brittle. And on large scale and flow, it can be more fragile. And so on large scale, that's why we go to graphite, because it's very, very strong and doesn't fall apart as easy uh, as RVC. So you can use graphite or another one we like to use is carbon fiber cloth, which is you, you, you can make a sweater out of it. It's just a cloth. Um, so yeah, all cheap carbon-based materials are fine. But when you're doing really large scale, we like to get away from RVC for really large scale. Okay, thank you. Yep. You know, we have a question in chat. Where do your reaction take place in such excess 10 mole in the kinetic or differential region? 
about the Kolb reaction and is the classical cell effect observed for these reactions. Where do your reactions take place in such excesses? I don't, I'm not sure I understand. Where do your reactions take place in such excess as 10 mole in each region in kinetic or uh, differential region um, i don't know classical cell i'm not sure i understand the question um where where do you write does that mean when we do when we do mole scale what kind do we do it in flow or batch um and then i'm not sure i the language of kinetic or differential region what that means does that mean at the at the bilayer at the electrode or in the electrodes in the in the solution? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yes, I also don't, don't understand. Okay, so dear colleagues, I think it's time to stop the questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time for your very nice lecture. I think maybe uh, you will obtain a new collaboration in Ukraine, not only with Yenamin and with Mikhailuk, but with other scientists from, from our country after your lecture. Thank you very much. I'd be very, very happy to, very honored to. Thanks so much. Thanks for the invitation. This was great. Great questions. Oh, have a nice day. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Take care. Hey. Thank you very much.